for the uninitiated, I've got Jeremy here of Jeremy and the Harlequins, which are probably one of my favorite bands in recent memory. Uh, there's something about your sound that's immediate. I love the hooks that are found throughout your sound. Thank you. Incredible. And uh, so, yeah, welcome to the show, Jeremy. Uh, welcome to Sonic Dorms. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So for those that don't know, um, where did it all begin for this project? Because I know previous to this, you, you had been working in um, some other bands, but uh, this sort of revitalized you into some new territory yeah, as an artist. For sure. Um, we started our, you know, I started with Craig, Jeremy and the Harlequins. Um, I think it was like 2013. And like you said, um, I met Craig, we were playing in different bands. I was in a band called We Are The Fury. He was in a band called Head Automatica. So we met on tour and we kind of like hit it off because we, we were both, I think, in our, in our respective older bands, um, like kind of big fans of like 60s rock and roll, like kind of classic, um, you know, early rock and roll and stuff like that. Um, and so I think we kind of like, vibed on that like pretty early on um when those bands split up we kind of found each other started playing together it kind of took a few years to figure out what we were going to do and then in 2013 it's like everything throughout the 2000s and and even early 2010s it was like rock and roll i feel like kind of got bloated and uh, just wasn't exciting anymore and the only place i kind of felt to go was kind of back to the roots of it like kind of the like I, I I think I was influenced early on as like just like at you know three to five years old by like Richie Valens, Buddy Holly, stuff like that, Elvis Presley, um, Gene Vincent and I figured like I, the only way at this point with where where rock was at that time was to, to really strip it down so like our first record American Dreamer is really stripped down we did that whole record in like two days um and that was that and we kind of built off of that and that's how a lot of bands used to do it they would they would record records year after year after year because they wouldn't spend more than maybe a couple of days in the studio crank them out go on tour and then come back right and i mean i think there's like something to that where it's like um, it's just it has to be there within a, you know those songs on those records were like two to three minute songs um, and it's just like something about the immediacy of that it's like and I think that's why it's like a, you know still to this day if like a, a three four five year old immediately gravitates to even like Chuck Berry or, or Little Richard um, because it's just like immediate high energy it's like instantly likable like you don't have to work at it like um it, it just grabs you yeah and you can probably something that can also be attested to that would be your your approach to the lyrics which again have a, a nod to that era where everything was a little bit more carefree a little bit more you didn't have to overthink things uh there was a slight underpinning of of you know whatever the social um whatever the atmosphere was like at the time really but with that being said there was always a sense of a jovialness to to the words it was something yeah. carefree about it. and I, I hear that a lot in in what you're doing as well is that something that you can uh, confirm yeah I, I mean I think like I also want lyrics that like say something and uh, you know doesn't have to be like you know it has to be somewhat explicit but I think it's um you know I want people to walk away being like oh this is there's some truth here to it you know yeah and um especially evident I feel like this new album Abracadabra which is out now I believe is probably it sounds to me like this band has finally like been fully molded there's something about this record where I feel like everything has coalesced, everything has come together neatly, and you guys have got that rhythm down now. Obviously, you guys are great, you know, from the beginning, but to me here, it's, it's all really gelling now. Is that something you can say that you agree with? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I like hearing that, <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I always, I always feel like um, with every record at the end of it, when we finish it, um, it's our best work. Um, I, the, having said that, um, I, I definitely with someone was asking me about this recently, and I feel like with this record, there wasn't any stone left unturned. There, there was definitely on the previous records, I was like, oh, I wish we would have spent more time at that. I wish we would maybe like had another couple songs instead of um, this one song. Um, I wish we would have maybe spent more time on production or less time in production. Um, there's always like things like that, like even though I thought it was like, you, you know, the best record we made at that time. This one, I think because of, um, you know, the pandemic was going on and we, we weren't playing shows because no one could play shows. Um, so we just were focusing on this record, like if this is the last thing we ever made, like, what do we want to do? Like, what do we want to say? Because that's kind of the feeling of the pandemic. No one knew what tomorrow was going to bring. Um, and so we just kind of wanted to put everything we could into this record. Um, you know, this record has like a lot of strings. It has, um, you know, like I said, like full string arrangements as horns, it has saxophone. Um, we, we almost had too much material. That's like, it's, I think out of any project I've ever done, this is the longest album I've ever made. It's like 13 songs with like, I think almost 50 minutes of music. Um, we're putting it out on vinyl and it has to come out on two LPs because, um, you know, it's, it, it's too big for, for one. So, um, yeah, I, I think like, yeah, it is, it is fully realized um, because we had the time and space to to uh to create it so you you pretty much answered my question which was going into this record yeah. what exactly was your approach this time around it sounds to me like your approach is really to just make a definitive statement go all the way like you said leave no stone left unturned and yeah. when i hear the record um there's a very from a production standpoint there's a very almost phil specter uh yeah. vibe to it. it's very elaborate the way specifically on a song like one shot of rock and roll there's a the way it builds you think you got it but as the song carries on i believe it's a little over five minutes as it yeah. carries on all these other elements start to come around and and by the end of it there's just like this fully realized bombast going on even though it's got this really simple message when you hear it uh, melody wise but production wise it just builds and builds and builds into the finale which is again yeah. incredible yeah Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I mean, again, like, I think simple messages are important, but also it's like, you can't just sit, say the same thing over and over and or I, I, at least I can't say the same thing over and over again in a song. It has to like, especially in this day and age where it's hard to get people to pay attention to something for more than three seconds. Um, five years ago, I would have said 30 seconds, but, but it seems like even less time. Um, like, I, I think we, when in a song like that it's like you keep having to introduce something new to the listener's ears like um lyrically and uh musically um so i think we did that on a lot of songs it's like some songs like there's uh, a new organ part or new string arrangement um that doesn't come in till midway through the song um i think uh or it's like a totally different unexpected part and i think that's uh you know, somewhat intentional because it's like we want people to, to uh, keep listening because there's something great just around the, uh, the you know, the next 30 seconds or something like that. So, um, and that's the way I am. Like, I mean, I'm not just criticizing like the listener, I'm a listener as well. So it's like, I like records um, that, you know, keep me interested. Uh, so I think that's why we kind of, you know did that right and and also from a production standpoint you work you decide to work with two producers in different capacities this time right. you had jeff sanoff uh doing tracking the the instrumentation and then you uh reunited with rick parker and for those who don't know rick parker's worked with uh it worked on a couple records i really loved for um black rev motorcycle club and um he did the final record with scott weiland and the wild abouts and yeah. back in 2015 called blaster which i was a huge fan of so it's cool yeah. to see he did the um he tracked your vocals am i correct yeah and i've been working with him 
God, for, for a while now. Um, he's, uh, we came back to him um, for our last album, Remember This, um, because I love the way he makes vocals sound. That's, and, and I love the way he mixes records. We didn't use him for the first two records because I think, like I was saying about American Dreamer, we w- really wanted to strip it down and do it fast and raw. And, um, but for the sound that we're, we're going for on the last record and now on Abracadabra, he's like the best at like, like making, I think what's in our minds, like become a fully realized um, production. Um, so, and, and that was, you know, so that's why we worked with Rick Parker with Jeff Sanoff. We had, I'd met Jeff right when I moved to New York. Um, and I liked like a lot of stuff. Uh, there's a lot of stuff I, I didn't even know he worked on that I was a fan of like the Obit stuff. Um, I didn't know he worked, he, he worked on that stuff till, till we worked with him um, this time, but he's worked with like Jesse Malin and little Steven. Um, and uh, we had always wanted to work together. So we were trying to figure out like in the pandemic, how we could make a record because most studios were closed. And um, so I hit up Jeff and hit up uh, their studio, little Steven studio. And that's kind of, we were like, well, if we track the music there, so that way, you know, we can get the right sound out that we need out of the band. And that studio is great and Jeff's great. But I really wanted to work with Rick Parker again. Um, so we we're like, all right, well, let's let's do both. And it was kind of like, uh, it, it seems like a, a little mad to, I guess, like do it that way. But it was like, we, we really wanted to, to do it that specific way. So, um, and it worked, so. So if you if you wouldn't mind sharing with me when it comes to tracking vocals in such a way and considering the pandemic was going on, I find this very interesting. Yeah. What how, what, how did that exactly go down? Did you record your vocals at a, at a studio and then sent your vocals over to Rick or how did that go exactly? No. So we did um, we recorded all the music um, in New York with Jeff at Renegade Studios. Um, and then I did a scratch vocal, but the weird thing is and we never, no one ever does this, I, I don't think, is because we wanted like on some songs you'll hear there's like a gang vocal or there's a lot of like chanting kind of like um, kind of sounds like so we actually cut those in New York before the main vocal was done. So then um, once all that was done um, and the string arrangements were done and the horns, all the bells and whistles, then we flew all the tracks on a hard drive to LA and Craig and I went to LA um, and we cut the vocals and mixed it there. So, and some of the stuff, like um, there's some like, like harmonies and, and gang vocals and stuff like that. Those were done before um, the main uh, vocal was done, um, which is kind of backwards, but that was the only way we could, we could do it. Um, And then, so I was like singing to the band that was recorded in New York. That's interesting. That's really cool. Were were they all, um, as far as vocal takes are concerned, do you have a specific approach? Are you like a a first take kind of guy, a second take? Do you take multiple takes and kind of mix it up and uh, comp them into one big take? How does that work exactly for you? Yeah, so usually it's like we do three to five takes of each song. and then like one of the reasons I like working with Rick is he's, he's really great at comping vocals. And sometimes I'll be like, oh, let's, let's use this other take for this verse, or let's use this half of chorus for the chorus. But he's really great. He kind of knows what I like to hear. And um, that's one of the reasons I like working with them. Um, but yeah, I, I pretty much, I guess the way I, I kind of do it is like, I usually like to have a couple drinks uh, in the studio and then just hit hit a song like um, maybe warm up once and then record it three to five times. And then usually we have it within one of those takes. I feel like it's usually like the third take is when it really gets good. Um, but there's something about the first take that's good and something about the last take that's good. And then we move on and we try and do, you know, anywhere from we'd probably do like three or four songs a day I think we did all the vocals in like two to three days for this album and then did the harmonies in like another two days and then uh yeah and then when it went into mixing I think total we probably spent like two and a half weeks making the record to me that's probably why to my ears at least um 
this album in particular, Abracadabra, which is out now, uh, anywhere you can stream it, there's something about it that it captures a certain like magic in a bottle. There's something at lightning in a bottle, it's magic. There's something about it that's very instantaneous. And you don't really hear albums like that anymore, in my humble opinion, where it's like something was captured here. It's very raw, it's very human. There's a soul on the record. It's something that you, re it really, there's something lively about it just because there's that human element. It doesn't sound overthought or manufactured by any sort of uh, computers or anything like that. It's very, there's a, a strong, it's very apparent that this was made by people as far yeah. as like instrumentation, vocals, the, the work that was put into it is it very old school, I guess, which is funny to say, but because to me, like that era of like people getting in a room and just playing doing a yeah. couple takes recording to analog or whatever it be and then calling it a day that's the record and i hear that here and it's fantastic i think it's very refreshing to hear an album like that again yeah i mean i, I it's something that i've always done and uh, i've always been a fan of um and like like on the first album american dreamer that was all analog and mixed to mixed on a board and cut to the tape and this one was kind of a combination of analog and digital and it was you know i mean ideally um you know maybe we would want to just do straight analog but digital's also gotten a lot better in the past maybe 10 to 15 years and um you know it was like i think it's definitely having analog outboard gear live instruments playing together um that that comes through almost more that's that to me is more important than just recording to tape um which i also like but i think that um you know so that's that's part of the magic there also i, I you know just for the budget i'm like to be able to do it like we wouldn't i don't think we would have been able to if we if we tried making this record in like the 70s or something we could have done it it would have just taken you know a lot more money and a lot more time um so there's something about like the new technology like specifically recording strings um doing more vocal takes we can all do that faster and create that sound by layering like string tracks over each other not having to to uh, hire an entire orchestra or something like that so it's like i, I guess what i'm saying is like um as much as a of a fan i am of of like classic recording styles and using all analog gear there is something to be said for utilizing the technology that's available um, to get the sounds that we want which are really the sounds from yesteryear but um we can do that now like we have the we have the technology you know so it sounds to me like you're using you're really just using the best of both worlds to your advantage right now which to me is i i think that's the way to go right it's it's, it's about taking a little bit of everything that you have and mixing the past with the present, maybe a little bit of the future too, right? Yeah, I think it's um, it's the only way to do it now. I mean, unless unless everyone has like a billion dollars to make a record, and 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 not only about money, but like time. It takes a lot of time to cut everything analog, um, and and just work that way. Like if you want, it, you can definitely do it with like punk rock records, um, but like to have all the bells and whistles and uh to do like i mean on some of the tracks like i would do like i don't know 12 harmonies i mean queen would do that um but you know they would spend a year making a record i just don't know any band any bands um that can do that now um and let alone would want to with how fast the world moves and how quickly like music is consumed um that like it's it's kind of like time is of the essence so so i think it's good personally i've found that it, it's like almost necessary to take advantage of the technology um both old and new and as far as um your vocal approach is concerned mm -hmm. where does that begin for you um as far as influences go because you I, you have a very um unique vocal uh, um you have very unique vocals and I think that they're very expressive and there's a, there's quite a range there, which I really enjoy as a listener. Um, mm -hmm. it, the same influences that you brought to your earlier bands, is that something that you still carry to this? Is that something that was always within you? 
as a singer? Have you changed or adapted as a singer in this project in, in Jeremy and the Harlequins or are you still yeah. bringing, yeah? I, I mean, it's definitely a little bit different. I think um, as, you know, time passes, like my, my voice has kind of changed a little, but um, I think the root of it, I mean, I still like my earliest like project, like that I really, you know, I guess we really started touring on was We Are The Fury. And with that, it was like, I was really into like 70s glam rock, like Bowie and T-Rex, which I'm still really into Bowie and T-Rex. So um, you can- That had hear. Venus, right? That was Venus? Yeah. That was yeah. great, yeah, love that. So it was like, even with that, I mean, like I, I still like, you definitely can hear like some of some of that in like um, Abracadabra. Um, and then like things I probably didn't even realize, like, I mean, back then I really you know I love Little Richard um you could definitely hear that in Jeremy and the Harlequins um I think it's just a natural evolution and uh I kind of came back to certain things that I liked um and uh you know I found new things that I I, I you know like I don't know not to give away all my my influences but yeah I just kind of pull from a lot of different places um but yeah, I think the root of it is is the same. And uh, something that I really think is awesome too is the fact that you guys don't seem to take yourselves too seriously when it comes to making your approach to making music videos. I think music yeah. videos are very fun to watch. I think for anybody who hasn't watched any uh, of your recent work, uh, yeah. I think it's really, again, very throwback, but in a way that's not necessarily nostalgic in any way. I think it's very refreshing and, and you've, you've added a new coat of paint to, yeah. to some of that stuff which i think is wonderful uh is that is that something that was conscious on your on your behalves like to make the videos complement the songs in such a way definitely to make them complement the songs um you know but we work with really awesome directors um who have their vision and sometimes we're even like look out of these three songs like these are the songs like the label's really feeling as a single which one do you really like and then we'll show them to a few different directors and kind of let them choose and that's the cool thing about, you know, I don't direct videos. So it's like we, we as a band kind of put our faith in the director and their vision. And, you know, sometimes we'll come up with a concept together, like on the It Won't Be Love video. It was uh, the director and I were trying to figure out like what we know the story of the song. How do we kind of implement that into, um, you know, a music video and make it like kind of a narrative? Um, but yeah, it's like, a, that's like kind of a combination. And that's what I, I like about working with um, different directors. And then it's kind of fun for us to see because we're, we're kind of um, a spectator in some capacity, even though we're helping make it, um, you know, we get the final product delivered, delivered to us. Um, whereas like with album, we're, you know, involved in every step of the way, kind of crafting it. The videos are like, um, you know, sometimes we'll be acting it, but we don't know what it's going to look like um, until it's done. So it's it's kind of exciting for us. When, when you finish an album, like once it's finished, it's wrapped up, do you look back at it, listen to it again and pick out favorite songs, songs that you personally really click with? Or do you just see the album experience as that's the album? I love the whole thing. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll listen to it. I know a lot of friends of mine who are musicians like some sometimes like they finish it and they're like I don't want to listen to it past uh the first time I listened to it um I like listening to it I mean um I was like kind of like I don't know I like the song so um a friend of mine was asking me the other day the same question and kind of was wondering if it was like like certain actors won't want to watch the movies they've been in it and I was kind of thinking like it's a little bit different maybe in the same way we were, we were talking about music videos it's like um with with like acting in something like we don't have like control over every element like when we're in a video so um I don't know it's also like maybe seeing yourself but like I've just kind of gotten used to hearing my voice and also it's like since we're like instrumental in the crafting of the album and like every decision so it's like it doesn't feel awkward to listen to it because it's like every everything that we let get recorded and that we 
that we sang on or you know i sang on or, or we played on um we were like all right that's the right right vocal take that's the right guitar part um so i think we're being hands-on makes it so it's like um you know i can listen to it fantastic how do you feel people have you how's the response has been to this album thus far do you feel like it's getting a lot of positive feedback yeah i mean so far so good i mean i think it's gonna be you know that's the main thing is um we just want more people to hear it um you know our labels pushing it um and we're gonna you know be touring on it more um but i think you know that's the job and i think that's the hard the hard part right now in the i don't even want to say the music industry but like just in the world right now is we have with the internet and streaming services it's like there's so much content, so many songs every day. So it's like the trick is really just how do we get people to listen because um, we believe in it, you know, and, you know, we'll push push the uh, the album up the mountain. Um, but yeah, we, we really created it not for for us to listen to in our bedrooms. We, we created it for people to to enjoy and uh, listen to in their cars and at home and and at concerts and stuff like that so you know that's that's the only thing and that's what that's that's really the the job that we're we're trying to do right now have you performed any of these songs live yet have you have you done any shows like even like i didn't you have a uh live stream event um uh, not too long ago oh we've we've played a number of shows um in the past year um probably probably like i don't know a dozen shows in the past year and we're we have a lot more coming up and a lot more that are getting booked right now. Um, and the response has been really good. Like, and that's the thing, like usually with, with um, other albums, like we kind of were able to play the songs live before we recorded them. Um, this was recorded and written um, in part during the pandemic. So there were no shows to be had. So it was kind of like the first time we played them live was, you know way long after the album was recorded so we just had to cross our fingers and and pray that people liked it i guess right right i i really do hope uh to catch one of your shows if you ever head down to uh, orlando florida that would be fantastic I, I love everything i've heard i'm a huge fan of this album i've already heard it several times um and i, I will be actually picking up a physical copy in my favorite format of cd that still cool. get cds but uh well, check this out. This is the CD we just, I just literally got them uh, right before this interview. Like, really? Uh, they got delivered to me. So I have all these boxes of CDs um, and you can also get it, you know, online and stuff. Um, but yeah, I was, I was scrambling to, uh, to bring up the boxes of CDs to my apartment uh, right before this. I wanted to just show it here. This is, this is it. The, the the album art was that a specific image that you uh you guys had picked out or was that something that was specially designed for for this album well this is this is me on the cover um but uh and we we've shot it with this really great uh photographer friend named uh julia robbins and um and uh it was her vision to to do kind of the bandanas on the face and um I know she had mentioned it and I didn't even really, really remember it. And she just starts putting bandanas on my face. And I was like, what is this? And she's like, I get, you have to trust me. And uh, she shot that. And I, I just thought it was like that we did a bunch of photos from that shoot. And, uh, but that was the one I was like, oh, this is like a real statement. I feel like about like the pandemic and about um, the world right now um, in, a, in a lot of different ways. Um, respects i guess um and it's just the uh, same with like um i think like the remember this cover it's like you do a photo shoot hoping we get the cover image and uh it's it's just like sometimes we'll be scrolling through and it's just like that's the one and um and that's what it was for this one is there a specific song that you're dying to play once you're out in front of crowds um well like I said, we have been playing and I think like my favorite songs off the, the album right now to play are One Shot of Rock and Roll and Let Me Out of You. Um, but also it's like we've been playing November Night 
and World on Fire. I'm just I'm sorry, I'm just looking at the song so I remember which ones. Um, and those have gotten a really good response. And it's been really interesting, specifically um, World on Fire, um, being it's like a slower, softer song and people usually come up and, and really like that song. Um, so yeah, it's, I, you know, I, I kind of like the ones, at least when it comes to playing live, I like the ones that people like the most. Um, I, like, I like hearing, um, you know, someone say like, oh, I can't get that out of my head or I really love that lyric or, you know, or um, I just want to sing that song with you guys, like stuff like that. that that's the stuff I like to play live. Yeah, I love Lullaby in the Dark. That's definitely uh, a highlight for me off the new album. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there's, as far as, because to me, we live in such a interesting landscape now with music, as far as like, because of streaming services, anybody can listen to anything. And people are being, especially the younger generation right now is being exposed to more genres of music. So yeah. when someone comes to like a live show now, especially for a band like yours, where like, there's this almost like throwback element to your sound what have you noticed as far as like the crowd that is gravitating to your music is there a specific crowd is a lot of variety eclecticism and the people that show up to your shows and buy your records or listen to your records in general have you noticed anything there as far as like eclecticism yeah it's it's really uh it is really eclectic and um i like that like honestly it's like we'll have shows where it's like um like 65 year old uh you know you know guy with like a, a motorcycle t-shirt and jeans and a 22 year old transgendered person and both of them are like you're you guys are my favorite new band you guys you know it's like it's it's it uh I love that. Like, it's like brings, you know, we want to bring people together with music um, and it's, it's music. It's, it, we're here to, uh, you know, make, you know, hopefully make you have a good time and um, create some joy out there. So yeah, it's really interesting though. And I think it's, it's, it's weird because I think for the, I don't know, for a number of years, like, I think like maybe record labels or, or, you know, the, the, bigger media companies like they kind of like uh don't they, they don't like trust people to have like um taste to be into something like this but i think if you like play it for them it's like it's they like it you know it's it's like we, we keep getting you know shoved down like kind of like trite contrived um shit and it's like people like good stuff when they know it exists you know um so it's like it, it's cool to see i guess like um a, a reaction from like all different genders races religions you know it's like it's it's music it's it speaks across um you know all all different you know labels that people subscribe to um and you know I, you don't have to take my word for it you can come see it so so uh i think it's really cool no yeah you're preaching to the choir because like i personally believe that music is universal and shouldn't be boxed in i think you know these boxes and these labels were created for you know mass consumption purposes making it a little bit more easier to organize certain things but at the end of the day a great song is a great song and i've always looked at the song and to me you can dress it up in whatever genre you want but at the end of the day if you like something, you like something, end of story. And I love bands that can cater to a wide variety of people. And it sounds like that's what you're doing. You're cutting through to those barriers and just, um, yeah. you know, yeah. you're making people love what you got. I love it. Yeah, that's uh, that's what, what our mission is. Fantastic. J Jeremy, it's really been an honor to have you on Sonic Dorms. This is also a little grassroots thing here that I'm building as a awesome. filter to get people uh, to get into bands that I personally think need to be listened to a lot more. Um, uh, and we need more filters out there. I think we need more people yeah. to preach about music and talk yeah. about music. And especially, all, you know, it doesn't matter because there's just so much out there, like you mentioned earlier, and we need more people just 
hey, this is what you should be listening to right now. Check this out. Here you go. And hopefully get some more people on board to music that they normally maybe would find it very difficult to come across or maybe not. But either way, it's cool to put your personality and subject people to things that um, you personally dig and hopefully bring some more people on board to some fantastic music, such as Jeremy and the Harlequins with Abracadabra, which is a fantastic release. Well, thank you so much. And I really appreciate it. Absolutely, Jeremy. Well, all the best. Uh, seriously, straight from the heart. Keep doing what you're doing. Seriously, don't give up because we need, I need music like this out there for my ears because there's just not enough of it, of, of this quality, I should say. You know, well-written songs, great performances, great production all around. Uh, so keep doing what you're doing, really. I wish you nothing but the best. All the success Thank in the world, really. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, uh, you always have an open seat here on Sonic Dorms. And um, until next time. All right. Take care.